Hertfordshire County Council are rapidly seeing the value and importance of delivering sustainability against the backdrop of climate change. And so to that end, I have been able to secure an interview with our uh, Director of Environmental Sustainability, Lynn Seeney. Good morning, Lynn. I hope you're well. Hi, Dan. Um, Hello, everybody else. Sorry, I can't be with you. First question, really quite straightforward. Can you just briefly introduce yourself, your role and your experience, please? Sure, yeah. I'm the Director of Environmental Sustainability for Arts County Council. And that means I'm responsible for the sustainability performance of the council as a whole. So if you like, I'm the coordinator, the whipper in. Um, we've set a number of objectives for our own performance for 2030 around carbon, around um, resource efficiency, around air quality uh, and around biodiversity. And then we have a wider set of um, ambitions for the county as a whole. So uh, I lead work by a number of county council colleagues with district borough councils and also other stakeholders right across the county to try to bring those about. Uh, in terms of my experience, I'm really an expert in sustainable communities. I've worked a lot in the built environment. I'm a former, former global head of sustainability for WSP and I've worked for regional assemblies and I've done a lot of work with communities. Oh, I'm also a former paramedic. That's important because it'll come up later. What does sustainability mean to you? That's really interesting. When I went to university, the term sustainability and sustainable development hadn't yet been invented in this context. In fact, it wasn't until 1992 that Gro Harlem Brundtland coined it at the uh, UN um, summit in Rio de Janeiro. So I did an environmental science degree and I graduated and I was going to save the world. That was definitely what, what my intention was. And I tried being a town planner. It didn't really work for me. And I went off um, to be a paramedic for a while, trainee paramedic. And I saw communities where people were falling through uh, floors because they'd taken up the floorboards to burn them to keep warm. And I saw other places where an elderly gentleman in particular had fallen in front of a fire and no one had seen him for three days because his house was so tucked away that no one ever walked by and he was completely isolated. And it was just when his carer went in you know, after three or four days that, that he was found. And it really brought it home to me that I want people to look after the environment. I think the environment's really important as a life support system for everybody. But people are not going to think about it if their own lives are so difficult and so um, hard that why would you think about anything wider than where your next meal's coming from or whether your, your kids have got something on their feet or whether um, you know, your health is? So I completely changed my approach and um, I was lucky enough to get a job as a community environment worker in inner city Bradford. And I brought sustainability in through helping people improve their own environment. So pocket parks, improving school playgrounds, growing food for people that couldn't afford that, bringing in the probation service to help retrofit people's homes to make them warmer, to get the bills down, getting smoke alarms into every house. There were two tragic deaths while I was working there from a house fire and um, people just couldn't afford smoke alarms they weren't going to spend a tenner on them in those days so um, we worked with the fire brigade to get low-cost smoke alarms out to everybody and that approach really taught me about why sustainability is important and it's for me it's because it considers the planet and the wildlife and the natural environment alongside people and it makes you think more about what drives people to do what they do and how you can work with where they are rather than wish where you wish they were so it taught me a lot about working with people, but that's why sustainability is important to me, because I've seen firsthand what a rubbish natural and a rubbish built environment does to people, as well as what people do to the environment. So I like the juxtaposition between environment, social and economic considerations. And I, I find it difficult to see how you progress one without the others. What role do local authorities have, seeing as we are tasked with overseeing and implementing policy across all aspects of the environment towards supporting climate change then? It's a tricky one, isn't it? Because there's no such thing as the community or the inhabitants of Hertfordshire. It's very multifaceted. You've got people who are deeply committed to environmental measures who want to go further and faster. You've got other people who are extremely sceptical and don't want to see their council tax uh, money spent in that direction. And we've got to somehow bring that together in a way that's acceptable to pretty much everybody, but accepts that there will be some people who want us to go faster and some people who don't want us to be doing this at all. I think we're in quite a good place 
in that we've got a very collaborative and encouraging um, way of taking sustainability forward. It's creating the conditions for people to do the right thing. So if you think of it like a normal distribution curve, so we've got a nice curve like that. Everybody's seen it over the years. We've got a group at the front that probably as a county council, we will be pulled by. They will be put, asking us to do more. They'll be doing things, trialing things, being pioneers. And we need to watch those, see what works, what we can adopt and what we can push into the mainstream. We've got a mainstream, the big bit in the middle. And that's the bit I really want to capture. Those who are already inclined to do good things or those who can be persuaded to act in sustainable ways by enablement, by sometimes grants or by making things easy, like the, the work that's been done recently on community buying of solar panels, get the price down. Uh, it might be building developments in a way that means it's easy for people to get their kids to school on foot or by bike, or it's easy to walk to the shops. So trying to, to shape it in that way. And then we've got the rump. The, the 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 bit at the back who will only ever respond to uh, directions or instructions or laws and rules and really those are the ones why you have um, you know road closures around schools that's why you have rules around what can and can't be done in um, public places etc cetera, etc cetera. we won't win their hearts and minds it is a group that we have to hit by sort of regulation and by enforcement. But that's hard and it's a tough message for people and most people don't need it, but it's a tool that we have to have in the armory. So it is thinking about all those different facets of environmental enhancement, environmental protection and taking that forward. So for climate change, we, we now have a new rule on biodiversity net gain, which is great. It means that all developers have to provide 10 percent better um, ecological environments after they finished the development. Um, and that is much better than the old thing. We'll try not to break anything. Well, it's, we'll squeeze some in uh, or we can't help destroying that bit. But it's a really important development. Well, now we're saying, OK, if you do do that, there's a consequence and you've got to fix it. You've got to do something about it. And it's not perfect. And it is like any other numeric system. It, it, it's open to uh, being played around with if you're not careful. But most developers are interested and keen and want to work with it. So, you know, we're in a plus position. We've got some really great developers in Hertfordshire who really do want to do the right thing. And yes, of course, we've got the same renegades as everybody else has got the Joe Bodgett and Run Brigade. But most people welcome it and are trying to do the right thing. And my job as a, at the County Council is to introduce a system that works well and supports the good guys, but makes it possible for us to spot the bad guys. Um, Hertfordshire have introduced this new team called Leeds. Can you just briefly introduce that, talk a bit about it? Sure. Well, when I yeah, when I joined the council, I found uh, three, maybe four different disciplines all working extremely hard um, to try and get developments uh, the best they could be in their area of discipline. I come from a background of a multidisciplinary consultancy and I wouldn't prepare a master plan like that and I wouldn't work on a project like that. If I want to deliver something like low carbon, for example, there's a role for the landscape architects, there's a role for the ecologists, there's a role for the um, archaeologists, and there's a role for the design sustainability experts. But if everybody's just doing their bit and beavering away separately, we don't talk about the joint solutions or the joint wins. And even worse, we give conflicting advice to a developer team and really didn't want that. Also, there's a lot of sense in having as many eyes and ears out there for each discipline as we can. And Dan, I think you'd agree. You know, the ecologists have learned a lot about archaeology. The archaeologists have learned a lot about landscape and we're able to, to help each other out by spotting things or commenting. You know, if, if we're at a meeting or a, a looking at a design where our, our colleagues aren't present, but we can also come up with joint solutions. So, so if we want to preserve something of heritage value, how do we fit that in a good landscape? What do we do with biodiversity net gain around that? So maybe there's something which, you know, a landscape which is Let's pick something like the uh, the landscape above um, um, Royston. It's a really historic landscape. It would be really easy for us to say, oh, we've got a target for carbon. We must get some trees up there. We must sort it out so that, you know, it's um, suitable for um, heavy recreation because it's so close to a, a settlement. Well, actually, the archaeological and historic value of it should take primacy there. But by having those discussions before we go out and making sure we're all aware of each other's issues, we can come up with a solution that works, which takes into account multiplicity of, of views and expertise. And we can go out with a fix it perspective rather than a 
silo to all oh, this is what I want and you do it or you don't. What would you like to see uh, from the heritage sector and in particular archaeology in helping to uh, achieve climate change? What do you think are the challenges or the opportunities in, in aiding this ambition at Hertfordshire? Well, I think first off is thinking about what we do to the environment when we're investigating. So there's definitely something there about the disturbance of soil um, soil, as most people know, I think um, helps sequester carbon. It's also a, uh, a very difficult to replace resource, particularly topsoil. Um, and it's easy to sort of scrape it all off and stick it in a pile and then shovel it back in. But actually, that doesn't preserve the soil horizons. It doesn't work with sort of putting back the, the wildlife the mini wildlife corridors, if you like, which have been dissected by having a, a, a trench dug through the middle of them. So I'd certainly like us to think about how we implement, practically do um, archaeological investigations and how we work with the ecology on site and the uh, ecological resources on site when we're doing that. But I'd then like to take it forward and say, OK, so if we're thinking about heritage and National Trust and CADOR and others have been fighting with this for, for years, how do you take a historic resource and make it into something which is usable in the 21st century? Now, this isn't you. you go and look at Felbrick Hall in Norfolk or other places. And the people that built these beautiful stately homes never lived in them in the winter. It was too, too damn cold. You know, they went back to London or whatever else. So this isn't new. But I think we've got to decide what is it that we want to have as an active living heritage and what is it that's um, a museum? If it's active living heritage, conservation areas or historic buildings in town centres that need to have a use or whatever else, how do we retrofit those so that they're not part of the problem, that they become part of the solution? I live in Letchworth Garden City. The Heritage Foundation is grappling with this. It's responsible for maintaining the character of a, a very historic, very important first you know, world's first garden city. It's got lovely heritage buildings in it. If you start doing external cladding, if you start putting PV all over it, it'll look terrible. But we're asking people to look after the heritage whilst at the same time taking whacking great bills, emitting huge amounts of carbon and being cold. And that's not really sustainable. So there's a big debate needed on how we help people in that kind of situation. Last question, if I may. Um, have, have you noticed a rise in interest in archaeology, landscape and ecology from a local authority perspective? I think there's been a lot of concentration at government level on what is good design. And there's a lot, been a lot of concentration on beauty. So as in creating a form which people find attractive today to be more acceptable. But certainly the movement towards better uh, landscape and ecology, let's take those first, has come from an appreciation of the health benefits of access to nature, being able to get outside, and all of this has been reinforced through COVID, of course. And we've got, I think, an understanding of how the landscape fits in helping people establish that sense of place. Where am I in the landscape? Where do I sit? I'm a, a small being in a big place quite often. If you then carry that through, I think we see an increasing interest in where do I come from? And I don't mean that in a sort of like who are my family thing. It's kind of like what went before, etc. And I think people are increasingly interested in the cultural aspects that precede them. So it's relatively, it's not a big logic leap to pull that forward into new development, is it? To help people find this sense of place in an increasingly mobile society. So your place where you live becomes increasingly important because that's where you make your identity, not in the workplace. So I think we'll see this increasing emphasis on where I live, because where I live is probably also where I work some of the time. And so people develop this interest in, OK, what is this place? Where does it come from? I can spend more time here. So interest is peaked and planning generally reflects societal trends. You know, things that are of interest at a given time. So go back to this, the 50s and 60s and you'll see a lot of space age architecture, you know, the services on the M M6 uh, or reflect very much the kind of space age because that was a zeitgeist at the time. At the moment, I think we're quite introspective, wondering who we are, what we're for. You know, a lot of people questioning their working life because of what's happened during COVID. And so this interest in place and community and 
what builds that the heritage on which that stands i think is increasing and something we should grab with both hands and ride it's a really important trend and one i think so much helps people establish themselves you know where they live and helps and helps build that that sense of community cohesion